A very good afternoon to all of you for coming to NUS for our third and final COP27 lecture. Um, this session will focus on the recent COP27 climate change conference in Egypt and how uh, negotiations there would affect the research and education agenda. My name is Audrey Tan and I'll be your MC and moderator for today's session. Today we will have three speakers who will give us an overview about the issues that they were looking out for at COP27 before we go into a panel discussion on today's topic. This COP27 lecture series is co-organized by the NUS Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions and is sponsored by One RHT Foundation, RHT Green and Verse. Our first speaker today is Ms. Melissa Lowe, a research fellow at the NUS Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. She previously worked at the NUS Energy Studies Institute, where she carried out research projects on a range of energy and climate issues concerning Singapore and the region. She has participated in the Climate Corps for over a decade and is an active sustainability thought leader. She is also the designated contact point for NUS accreditation to the UNFCCC and serves on the nine-member steering committee of the Research and Independent Non-Government Organization constitu Constituency, or RINGOS. So first up, uh, we would like to welcome Melissa on stage to deliver her presentation. Thanks everyone. Just want to say thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, really pleasure to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you all about uh, the COP27 outcomes. I think as many of you will be aware, uh, COP27 was held in Sham al Sheikh, Egypt uh, just a couple of weeks ago and several members of my team here at the Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions and NUS uh, went to Sham al Sheikh and so, so we're happy to share with you today about what are the key outcomes Comes. But before that, uh, recognizing that there may be members in the audience today and joining us online uh, for the recording that may not know about the Paris Agreement and what COP is all about, I thought I would just give you a very quick uh, run through about uh, what the COP means and what the Paris Agreement is, uh, just so you can follow the, the outcomes a little bit better. Okay. So um, this will be the overview that I'll be sharing with you today. So I'll give you a very brief uh, introduction to the international climate change regime. For those of you who have heard this before, please indulge me. Uh, and then the key elements of the Paris Agreement. Uh, what were the expectations going into COP27? Right, you have to understand what was expected out of COP before assessing whether or not it was successful or not, right? So um, I'll give you a sense of uh, what people in general, countries were expecting from COP27 and then move to the outcomes. And I'll give you an analysis, uh, my take and some of my colleagues take, uh, especially colleagues in the research community, those of us who've been tracking the COP for many years, I think in the introduction, Audrey uh, very kindly shared that actually, yeah, this year's COP was my 10th COP. So I'll give you a sense of uh, how things have changed in, in based on my observation. And finally, because the topic for today is uh, what implications are there for the research and education agenda, uh, and we have a full lineup of NUS speakers today, so um, we I will talk about how Singapore as well as NUS contributed to COP27 and also what are some opportunities that we think might be available for COP28 in Dubai next year. So the international climate change regime broadly looks like this. So it starts with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, I like to call this the umbrella uh, agreement, right? It's from which everything else comes, uh, such as the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. So um, the Kyoto Protocol's official commitment period was only for five years, from 2008 to 2012, and its Doha Amendment, right, so the amendment was, held, was done in Doha, signed in Doha, it tried to extend the timeline of the commitment period, commitment period number two, to 2020. And parties were only able to do that at the end of 2020. So, but that's the predecessor to the Paris Agreement. Okay, so COP27, we've already moved on from the Kyoto Protocol regime into the Paris Agreement regime. And I, of course, for today, uh, because of time, I won't be able to talk about the other UN bodies like the World Meteorological Organization, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are all part of the ecosystem of UN uh, bodies talking about climate change, right? And they'll be part of the solution as well when we come and address uh, this critical issue. And when we talk about COP, COP actually stands for Conference of Parties. And the COP 
number that follows after, number 27, is actually just stands for the 27th meeting of the Conference of Parties. Okay, so, so don't be, be, be too worried and confused about these numbers. And um, the CMP, uh, it stands for the Meeting of the Parties to the Kyoto Protocol. And why, is, why are these bodies all different? Because some countries didn't even sign up to certain treaties, like the US was never party to the Kyoto Protocol. So when these parties meet in these supreme bodies, right, the court meetings, there's a differentiation in the, in the way that their flags are presented. So for example, the United States uh, will have a different colored flag uh, when they sit in the plenary session for the Kyoto Protocol parties. And then the final one, the CMA, uh, it stands for the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement, and the CMA has met for the fourth time uh, at this COP. So the numbers just correspond to the number of times that parties have met. Okay, so of course the UN FCCC, as I said, is the umbrella agreement, and what it does is to uh, give give life or give force and, and enforces these other treaties, and it's actually very basic or very, uh, it's just a framework. So you have to have all these other treaties in order to create obligations for countries uh, under these treaties. Okay, so the Paris Agreement was agreed in 2015, in December, in Paris, France, that's where it gets its name from. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about the COPs henceforth. Okay, so parties go to these meetings to negotiate the rules and how to operationalize, it's a very big word, uh, parties need to implement the Paris Agreement, right? And the agreement is only 36 pages long. It has, again, very little in there that, that fixes countries uh, to targets. So the targets are in the form of nationally determined contributions. Um, and I'll cover this in, uh, after this slide, which is the key elements. So it's a lot to cover, a lot to go through. I won't have time to go through everything. But the, the, the thing is, with Paris Agreement, what we are starting to see is that all countries, and not just the developed countries, have obligations. Right? And these obligations are actually ascribed in a bottom-up fashion rather than a top-down fashion that the Kyoto Protocol uh, uh, had in place. Okay, so um, these are the key key elements, and you can see some of uh, some of these issues are maybe uh, you if you came for our first lecture uh, on Article Six, you will notice that uh, market and non-market approaches is on there in the in the second row. Um, so that's Article Six of the Paris Agreement, which addresses carbon markets. So these are the, the key elements, and if you're interested, you can go to the Paris Agreement and the accompanying decision text to have a look further. So the Paris rulebook took three years for countries to negotiate and come, come to an outcome in Katowice COP24. But there was one issue, Article 6, which only concluded last year in COP26 in Glasgow. Okay, the reason why it took so long because it's extremely complex and technical. And also uh, what you will notice later when I talk about expectations going to COP27 is that actually some of the issues weren't even con concluded by, by COP26. So they came up with a, a generic outcome, but there's some of the details uh, on environmental integrity were not yet agreed. But I think we were able to achieve some uh, progress in COP27. So I mentioned nationally determined contributions, and I won't belabor the point here. These are basically climate targets. Okay, and, and so if you hear anybody say NDCs, these mean the climate targets that come under the Paris Agreement. Um, one Criticism of the NDC model has been that because it's bottom-up, countries decide for themselves. They nationally determine these contributions. Um, they don't really get to where we need to get to, which is to keep temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And they came in all shapes and sizes. Right? So the, the graph on the right shows you the kinds of NDCs that are available out there, right? countries have put forward. Some of them are deviation from business as usual, Right? Some of them are fixed level targets. The one that Singapore has is a fixed level target, right? but it came from an uh, intensity target before. So there's also an evolution uh, of NDCs, simply because Paris Agreement asked countries to put together a five-year ambition cycle. So every five years, countries have to update their nationally determined contribution. If you're not confused already, <laughs> you know, don't worry, okay? This, this is not meant to be difficult. Like, these are just climate targets. They have to be updated every five years. Okay, that's all you need to know for now. All right, so because we have had five years since Paris Agreement, actually it's the seventh year already, right? So a Paris Agreement was agreed in 2015. Um, we've seen a growth in the coverage, which is good news. So if the first round of NDCs were not good enough, the good news is that there's progress being made and NDCs are getting better. 
there's more coverage, more sectors. So in, in, in the beginning, maybe they only covered energy and transport. Now they've covered uh, industry, uh, agriculture, and so on and so forth. And if you're really keen to find out more about NDC coverage, you can go to the synthesis report. The UN FCCC Secretariat does an excellent job every time a COP uh, is supposed to negotiate these issues um, to, to come collectively assess whether countries are getting to um, the collective ambition that we need to get to to reduce the emissions gap. Um, so I won't go into detail here, but the Glasgow Climate Pact, I think some of you may be aware, asked that countries revisit and strengthen their targets. And Singapore complied, and we actually submitted a strengthened target, which is uh, we moved from a 65 million tonne peak to a 60 million tonne fixed level target in 2030. But only 23 to 30 countries submitted new targets uh, in 2022, which is fairly disappointing. And based on the calculations by the UN Secretariat, they said that this will take us to 2.8 degrees warming, which is still a far way off from 1.5. Okay, so, so this is, progress is being made, but not fast enough, not nearly fast enough. Uh, so the long-term low emissions development strategy is also enshrined in the Paris Agreement, although the language in relation to long-term strategy is a, a bit more loose than the, the man, mandatory NDCs. So instead of all countries shall submit a long-term target, which is a 2050 target, the, the language says strongly encourage. So it's not surprising that only 53 countries have submitted long-term low emission strategies. Singapore is one of them, so we should feel proud about that. Um, and also, it actually doesn't really say 2050 even in the text, which is why some countries have said 2060, 2070, and so on. Okay? That's how they define mid-century, apparently. Okay, so this is a, just a snapshot as of 2022. What are some of the, the um, uh, targets and, and uh, how, how much emissions around the world they cover? Okay, so uh, COP24 was the, the year in which uh, the Paris rule book was concluded. And that gave all of us, the whole world, a very good basis from which to negotiate. And we can come to this during the Q&A later, but the, this begs the question, now that the Paris rule book is concluded, is there really a need to go to COPs every year or hold a COP every year? Because what more is there to negotiate? We should be implementing already, right? That's a question that I've been getting since uh, last year, in fact, and uh, since I got back from Egypt. And we can, we can absolutely talk about this. But the key thing here is that some of these rules need to be revisited. Once countries start to report on their progress, they go through the accounting guidelines, actually some things may be flawed. There may be gaps in the, in the rules and guidelines and they may actually have to revisit and they have to go to a COP to do this because they're all enshrined in outcomes. Okay, the, now, now comes to the point of expectations going into COP27. So the issues, uh, there were several issues agreed at COP26 uh, which included a greater climate ambition. I think all of you will be aware that fossil fuels finally made it into a decision text uh, at COP26, where countries agreed to phase down uh, fossil fuels but not phase out. Right? There was a compromise among countries. Uh, common timeframes for NDCs so that they are not in all shapes and sizes and different kind of years and non-comparable. Uh, they agreed that they will set a new climate finance target uh, from 2025 onwards, and they agreed on the uh, Article 6 market and uh, non-market mechanism approaches, uh, guidelines, and transparency, uh, which is something close to my heart, were, was finally agreed. Some of the tables also were, were agreed at COP26. So the key message from the COP26 outcomes going into COP27 was that the full rule book really provides us now with a basis to deliver on the Paris Agreement. No more excuses, okay? And uh, in order to track progress, we need to report to the UNFCCC. Again, because these targets are all bottom up. Um, there was a need to, there was a call to increase climate finance because everything needs money to be done. Um, and countries started to also gain, uh, momentum was gained about the loss and damage fund, which was finally agreed at COP27. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, there was unprecedented language on fossil fuel phase down. But something to keep in mind going to COP27, I think we're not, we're certainly not disillusioned. Uh, we are in a world of crisis uh, going into COP27. The Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis created an energy, another energy crisis. There's also recession and inflation around the world, which I think uh, many countries then felt hesitant to submit new and more ambitious targets because they're not sure uh, whether they can actually achieve them. If they have to revert back to coal or oil, 
right, from, from, from gas, right, because gas is short and very expensive, then their targets are definitely not going to be reached. So I think there was a huge hesitation from countries. And of course, with inflation, uh, you also, as a, as a government, you also need to address these social concerns, right? And that takes away the priority from climate change or climate action. So going into COP27, the UN agenda was as follows. Um, there was a schedule, uh, it was scheduled that countries would talk about a mitigation work program. Okay, um, to re increase pre-2020 ambition. Uh, they were also going to talk about making progress on a global goal for adaptation, GGA. And if any of you are interested in adaptation, our second lecture, and you can look at uh, our recording on YouTube, uh, Sandeep talks a lot about the global goal on adaptation and how important that, that is. Uh, loss and damage uh, was a key issue going into COP27. We all knew this, and in particular because it was an African COP. Right? It was held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, and it was touted as the time for Africa to, to come together uh, and, and, and fight for these uh, issues. Climate finance, again, uh, same thing because it was carried over from COP26. And finally, the full oper operationalization of Article 6, essentially to give more detail to the rulebook. And the Egyptian presidency also had their own goals. I mean, it's the prerogative of any president of a COP to come up with overarching goals. The UK definitely did that with the cash, cars, coal and trees targets, right? Their leadership declarations. So the Egyptian presidency also tried to do the same. Uh, and then we'll talk about it later, about whether they managed to achieve it. Uh, okay? Because there were quite a number of logistical challenges uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, getting to Sharm el-Sheikh and then in Sharm el-Sheikh itself. So this is a snapshot of the COP26 outcomes. I'll go through them one by one. I have to do it quite quickly. Um, the first was that um, the global goal for adaptation, it was agreed that, um, so there was a framework to double uh, developed countries' contributions uh, to adaptation finance. Uh, and then they will also do this through science-based indicators to assess the adaptation needs of countries that say they need the, the, the adaptation funding. And the key thing, of course, in the center is the loss and damage fund was finally agreed. Um, and this was, if you don't know what loss and damage is, it's actually, um, we talk about loss and damage in terms of irreparable or irreversible loss. And this could be in the form of economic loss and non-economic losses. Um, and a facility would effectively allow compensation by countries who want to contribute to this fund for these uh, irreversible losses. Um, I'll talk about this in the analysis shortly, but um, it's like a bucket, but nothing to go in, okay? Because they didn't agree on the funding mechanism so far. Um, Article 6 made some progress as well. The initial report outlines were agreed and review guidelines for Article 6.2 agreed. There's also a new term that was coined on mitigation contribution, Article 6.4 ERs. If anyone is interested, we can talk about it later. Um, new finance goal, uh, mitigation work program, all these were procedural outcomes, so nothing no major headlines okay, uh, coming out of COP27, Sharm el-Sheikh. There was a lot of argument about the mitigation work program. Uh, some of you who have been following, uh, you may have heard about the net zero argument. Right? On the one hand, developed countries wanted to ascribe net zero uh, and uh, by 2050 in the text, but many developing countries said, look, there's no way that's happening. Uh, and because many of them also had already announced 2060, 2070. So it was really a big fight. And there's, in, in my opinion, there was too much attention on, on some of these cover decisions. Uh, and it took time away from other things as well. Uh, the technical dialogue of the global stock take. Global stock take uh, is happening next year in COP28 in Dubai. Um, but there's a long process leading up to the global stock take. And so part of that process took place at COP27 uh, this year. Um, and then some momentum hopefully will be started up again uh, by the New York Climate Week in September. Usually it takes place uh, the sidelines of the UN General Assembly. Okay, other notable outcomes. I don't think we have time for this, but just to say that two weeks is a long time to be at a COP and there are many other agenda items, including on agriculture. So the Coronavir Joint War on Agriculture. Uh, response measures is something uh, that Singapore actually pays attention to because uh, you know we have a fairly high dependence on fossil fuels and it talks about the positive and negative impacts of uh, moving away from fossil fuels. Um, there's a long-term global goal for staying below 1.5 that was also looked at, common metrics. Um, as, as far as NUS is concerned and any educational institution, um, the ACE 
uh, action for climate empowerment track of the COP is important because uh, this talks about how uh, you know we need to do more to empower and educate people on climate change and it's uh, the ways in which we can do that. Uh, gender and climate, some of you may be interested in this. There was also uh, the extension of the gender action plan. And uh, now it's in the text, and enshrined in the text, that parties are asked to have gender balance. Um, many of you, some of you may have seen Minister Grace Fu's LinkedIn post about the world leaders, and she, she had one question, where are the women? There were two world leaders that were women in, in a family picture of, of uh, world leaders that came for the high-level segment. So I think this really sparked the gender groups to raise this issue. Um, and of course, they also invite future court presidencies to appoint more women to the high-level champions. So I think this is, this is important for, for, for some constituencies that attend the meetings. So the analysis, okay, so here comes the good part, right? Um, the loss and damage fund was established, uh, was the key outcome and decision of COP27 was pretty much the only thing that made, made the headlines. And on top of it, they actually didn't really even commit to funding it, which is a bit of a pity, right? Uh, they've kicked the can down the road, essentially, to COP28 to decide how to fund it. Um, so the promise of an African COP wasn't really fulfilled. Um, and many topics around adaptation and special circumstances of Africa wasn't even addressed at all, even though it was touted as an African COP. On Article 6, um, although decisions did do provide more clarity, um, there also is a lot more work to be done uh, to make sure that if countries who want to buy uh, from host countries in terms of carbon credits, that they're not going to rescind their approvals later on. Okay, so there's a lot of argument back and forth, uh, different countries have different interests um, uh, on Article 6. So progress, but then there's still some things that uh, it, it's still very confusing for, for many people on how markets are going to operate and whether there is going to be environmental integrity. Um, the mitigation work program uh, had a very loose scope to begin with. Some people also ask me, what's the difference between the mitigation work program and the global stock take? So which means that it wasn't, very, it wasn't scoped well or... It could mean that it was intentionally scoped very loosely so that nothing would come out of it. Okay, and I can, I can, I can, um, yeah, I can see how that would happen. Um, and, and so basically, uh, because only 23 countries submitted their NDCs uh, before the COP, it was already, the, the sentiment was not great going into COP27. Yeah, so, so I think it's important uh, that one of the outcomes was that those countries who did not submit their targets this year, they're asked to submit it next year. Okay, so the remainder of the countries are still um, being put pressured on to increase their targets next year. Now, the last thing I, I do want to spend a little bit of time on this, the presidency um, did encounter a lot of problems. Uh, you know, there were a lot of issues around uh, Egypt and Sharm al-Sheikh going there. Uh, firstly, of course, uh, logistics was really difficult. Um, the Egyptian presidency had a really, really small team, only 12 people in his core team. So you can't be everywhere, right? So uh, a lot of issues didn't have a presidency representative, which means that it didn't take priority in his agenda. Um, and also, there was a lack of transparency because there was so few people on the ground on, from his team. Um, they didn't put out information quickly enough, so people were left quite confused. Um, there were more pavilions than ever, and so it became like an expo. Less of a negotiation, more like an expo. Um, yeah, good for some people, but it was also generally felt that it was a money-making scheme, lah, right, going to the COP. And um, so, so the pavilions also had incidents of stealing. So the staff were stealing from pavilions. Actually, uh, I was told that our snacks got stolen from a pavilion, which is quite sad, like Maggie noodles and stuff. Um, and then there was a lack of water around the COP uh, venue. Uh, you might have seen one of our presenters even fainted, right? Yeah, there was actually a, a, a lack of water around the venue. Food was also particularly expensive. And there was a document circulating uh, even before the COP that the hotel association apparently uh, asked hotels to increase their prices by five times at least. So it was, it was generally seen as, for many people, it was the worst COP ever. And many people also were super turned off by going to a COP ever again. Um, uh, harassment complaints were also heard. Uh, you know, people actually yeah, getting harassed in the conference venue itself, even though there's a code of conduct uh, at the, these UN meetings, and worse, outside of the COP, also in taxis and so on. So I think it was generally a, a very challenging COP for many people, and if any of you know people who have been to COP, they will tell you, the, I'm sure they will tell you the same. Yeah. Okay, so 
Now to the good things, all right. Singapore had its inaugural pavilion at the at the COP this year after many many years of participating, and we're also very proud that Minister Grace Fu was invited to co-facilitate ministerial discussions on Article Six. All right, she was one of several uh, this year, but last year uh, it was just one track, and she was already the co-facilitator with Norway, I believe, and this year she was asked to facilitate uh, facilitate some tracks as well. Singapore also joined an Article 6 implementation partnership initiated by the Japanese Ministry of uh, Environment and the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership that was originally initiated by the UK last year. So I think uh, we are following up with uh, all of the agreements that we agreed to last year. Um, so um, this is important uh, because we, we obviously want to be an active uh, player and, and participate meaningful in these meetings. And the inaugural pavilion, uh, again, was very exciting but quite tiring. Uh, there were over 5,000 visitors to our pavilion, one of many pavilions. I think it was like 150 pavilions or something. Uh, there were almost 60 pieces of programming, panels, discussions, uh, and launches, MOU signings, and 718 people took the Green Climate Pledge uh, that MSC has been promoting. Uh, so I think uh, overall, I think good, good sentiments uh, that Singapore uh, can showcase our innovation and our bright green spark right at these international meetings. Uh, NUS also participated uh, at COP27 and some of the key highlights are here. Um, you can watch all of these webcasts uh, from our events on the COP Pavilion website. They'll be available for some time. But I just want to give a shout out actually. So CNCS uh, did our events, but we also had Tropical Marine Science Institute who ran a, an event uh, at the Oceans Pavilion. And uh, we increased the representation from Southeast Asia, which is great. Um, and we also had Center for International Law, which gave a virtual dialogue uh, and partnered also with Durham University. Um, the Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, Ben Keshaw, Prof Ben Keshaw also moderated a dialogue. So, so good representation from NUS this year. I think we definitely have more opportunities next year. Um, Minister Grace Fu has already said that she wants to do a bigger pavilion. She just posted on LinkedIn this morning. Uh, so apparently she wants to do a bigger uh, COP uh, pavilion next year. So something to think about if any of you are uh, with NUS and you want to contribute you can think of ways uh, to come up with panels, side events, exhibitions we'll be happy to hear uh, your ideas so uh, with that uh, I just want to hi highlight CNCS resources, uh, we have published work on COP uh, and also commentaries and we've done briefings so if any of you wanted to just catch up on what's been happening and what our expectations were going into COP please feel free to download these resources um, and these are all available on our YouTube page and this recording also will be up there later and with that thank you very much okay. Thank you so much, Melissa, for that great overview of key outcomes at COP27. I'm sure you guys have more questions, so you can quiz her on that later. But just one note on gender representation. I just want to point out that today's panel is entirely all women. So kudos to us for that. Uh, our next speaker will be Ms. Danielle Yao, an adjunct senior research fellow at the Centre for Singapore Law and concurrently a senior advisor at the boutique consultancy. Danielle is a council member of the Singapore branch of the International Law Association and a member of the Singapore Domain Name Dispute Policy Panel at the Singapore Mediation Centre. She was most recently the Deputy Director General of the International Affairs Division of the Singapore Attorney General's Chamber, Singapore. Uh, Danielle will be presenting to us virtually, so over to you, Danielle. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. I've sent my screen share. Let me know if you are able to see the slide on your end. So thank you very much for the invitation and, and, uh, and the introduction. And thanks very much, Ashley and Melissa, for setting the stage so well. Um, certainly makes my job very much easier. And I'll be skipping some of my uh, presentation, uh, which has already been covered very well by Melissa. Um, I will focus um, in my presentation on three things. Um, the key outcomes, related developments, I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of these selected issues, but clearly not everyone, not every issue, given the breadth of issues that were covered. I'll share some reflections, um, some analysis, some critique that has been uh, made by other commentators as well. Uh, and then finally, ending off with a bit of snapshot on some of the climate change law and policy work done at the centre, and that kind of uh, uh, links with the, the theme, which is the question of 
um, how the COP27 impacts on uh, uh, agenda in terms of education and in terms of research. So first, let's look at some select uh, outcomes uh, and developments. And as Melissa mentioned, COP27 really was built as an implementation COP. We've done all the target setting, we've done all the normative, key normative discussions, mainly primarily have been completed in, in terms of the work relating to the Paris rulebook and the Katowice. Uh, and then we're shifting from target setting to implementation phase, which is really at the stage now of you know, delivering climate action, delivering the support necessary for to drive the climate action. So this was built as really an implementation COP. The question is, did we achieve that? The COP achieved that. Kind of uh, break it down into a couple of key outcomes. Uh, mitigation uh, has already been addressed by Melissa. I won't touch it too too much. Uh, just to stress that uh, despite there was some initial pushback in terms of the language of reverting to Paris, but eventually uh, the meeting fortunately coalesced around keeping alive the emphasis on the 1.5 uh, temperature goal. And that was a key um, uh, uh, outcome after all the pushing and through, uh, pushing and and uh, to and fro uh, during the discussions um, in Shamoche. And as mentioned by Melissa, calls for this deep, rapid, sustained reduction in GHG emissions of 43% by 2030 relative to 2019. So there was a, a Glasgow work program as well to scale up the to scale up the mitigation action to be operationalized. No details of costs were reached at uh, this meeting, um, but uh, what was emphasis on non-prescriptive nature, non-punitive nature, facilitative nature, really preserving the bottom up philosophy and approach um, of Paris Agreement. So this is again where you see a tussle or two and fro between the developed and developing countries in terms of their respective roles and, and contribution to mitigation action. An important language there that preserves this bottom-up philosophy that respects the principle of CDPDR um, and national sovereignty and national circumstances. Right? Now, the next element was adaptation. Again, uh, this was touched on by Melissa. It's really launching the process um, to guide uh, really the GGA work program going forward. Um, what I wanted to highlight really there in terms of relate, what is relating to adaptation are the pledges to the adaptation fund. So we saw more than 230 million US for the most climate vulnerable uh, states in 2022. So this was the part of the finance pledge, so to speak. Um, repeated, but of course it's not enough. So repeated calls to double the adaptation finance, and and going forward, the standing committee of finance will be preparing a report of this commitment, really in terms of transparency and and accountability, right? In terms of holding countries to account where they are in terms of these pledges. Related to adaptation was also interesting language relating to early warning systems, and was really a proposal or initiative of the a call by the UN SecGen. Uh, for a global sort of a worldwide extreme weather, early climate change, early warning systems within five years. And this, in terms of the sciences, was felt to be important, both in terms of adaptation and in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation, having early information does help in that regard. Now, in COP, uh, as some of you will realize, is often a two-track process. There's the formal COP process and what we call the side events. Um, and increasingly, uh, in you know, increasing increasingly becoming more like a business fair, right? And so along, typically along COP, with COP meetings nowadays, you have the formal outcomes, announcements, but along the side where they're also sort of semi-formal, informal, you know, uh, initiatives that fall outside the formal umbrella of COP. And under the adaptation, we saw um, the, what is again, what we see quite typically in recent years, presidency, uh, initiatives, high-level champion initiatives, and under this sort of uh, parallel track, we saw the Shamoshek adaptation agenda, which really outlined something like 30 adaptation count, uh, account outcomes to enhance the resilience for uh, people living in the most climate vulnerable uh, communities by 2030. So interesting side sort of parallel initiatives. Loss and damage, of course, was the key highlight uh, uh, outcome. Uh, some have just called it a historic outcome because there was finally an establishment of a dedicated L&D fund as part of a broader funding arrangements for dust and damage. Now, going into COP27, of course, there was a lot of interest um, uh, around loss and damage, a lot of expectations, but also a lot of skepticism as to whether there will be any concrete outcome that will satisfy uh, demands of the developing countries or the climate vulnerable countries. And 
not not to forget, it was really in an era of a lot of mistrust, uh, shortfall in, in finance, um, and continued resistance on the part of developed countries, uh, allergy to any suggestions of more funding, compensation, or liability. And in the end, for some depth maneuvering right at the start of the COP20 uh, of the COP session, uh, the inclusion of an agenda item to discuss this issue. So that already set the stage for this item to be really part of the formal to be given proper attention to. But very important to understand that when this was added to the agenda, very carefully crafted language was put in place, uh, language that made it very clear that this is not a basis or not a start for any discussion vis-a-vis -vis compensation or liability. Right? So again, this was quite an issue that was a red line, very allergic in terms for uh, developed countries. Having provided the qualifier and caveat, the discussions on loss and damage funding were able to proceed. But of course, it was not easy. Uh, no, this, no decision uh, agreement. This was actually reached until the very, very end of COP. And what we have now is a decision on a loss and damage funding uh, funding mechanism, so to speak. A transition committee will give uh, recommendations to operationalize the fund. Uh, with the COP presidency to convene uh, consultations before the next COP, very high level ministerial consultations. Um, interestingly, international financial institutions were also invited specifically under the language in the, in the, in the decision um, to consider this issue at their next meeting in spring, in the spring meetings next year. Uh, and what's the potential for these institutions to also contribute to the funding? Um, but what we have is really just a bare bones language. Um, many questions remain. Who is eligible to receive the support? How will this work? What activities will be funded? Who is to contribute? These are all um, questions that remain to be um, addressed. Finance um, really was, in some cases, uh, in some senses, also the significant focus on finance on multiple fronts, right? Um, some have even called it really effectively a finance call because of all the attention on finance. We know that there's a continued shortfall um, by developed countries in meeting the goal of mobilizing uh, 100 billion per year by, uh, for, for mitigation action. That continues to be a shortfall, um, continued work on the long-term climate goal. Um, but what I wanted to flag here is, is really a, a, a language that I suppose can be traced, influenced perhaps by what we call the Bridgestone Initiative. Um, really language that talks about the transformation of the financial system, the need to really transform the international financial system, the structures, the players, the actors, the banks, central banks, investors, other financial actors, really to kind of shift their sort of entire financial system with a climate lens, right? There's new language relating to uh, the role of multilateral development banks and the IFIs. Again, as I said, calling on them to reform, the systems, the priorities, the practices to align the funding, to mobilize the climate finance, uh, looking at the operational model, um, really effectively, really a, a, a call, so to speak, that this MDBs and IFIs are not doing enough and can do more, right, in this sphere. So that is quite interesting. What will develop from here going forward is worth monitoring. As I said, lots of parallel initiatives, slew of other finance. I won't go through all of them. This is just, it's just a, a snap, a, a little bit of a snapshot of which the amount of attention that was placed on finance, on forestation. What is that? What what kind of financing? Um, you know, uh, interesting bottom-up uh, suggestions in terms of the funding model that is proposed by Indonesia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Brazil. Right, calling for compensation to them for reducing deforestation. Um, so various, various um, initiatives that you can spend your time to look at it. Some look, some are model on insurance sort of funds, uh, models, some are looking at green bonds, and so on and so forth, right? Interestingly, World Bank led in climate investment funds to get funding for nature-based solutions. So quite interesting, new, innovative, various funding models are coming up uh, to, to look at. Global stock take, won't look at it too much. Article 6, all these have been dealt with. Um, in terms of agriculture and food security, yes, there's a work program on that. And what this does to do, aims to do really now, is a sort of a holistic approach to try and address climate impacts on both agriculture and food security. 
right? Um, in terms of compliance, I also wanted to flag this because uh, not more technical aspect, not as well known, not as sexy, but very important piece of the pie, the rules of procedure for the committee to facilitate implementation promote compliance is, has been adopted fully now in place. And now we can begin to see the effective operation of the compliance committee established under Article 15 of the Paris Agreement. Um, this is an important tool um, in holding parties count. It's not, a, it's not a sort of a punitive. It's very clearly not drafted as a punitive or sanction model in terms of enforcement. It's not drafted like that, but this is a very important model uh, mechanism to hold parties to account for their obligations, for example, reporting obligations under the Paris Agreement. So very important development, and we will start to see from here uh, actual cases uh, matters and complaints being brought or being examined by the committee. Um, some other issues are uh, a little bit more uh, not, not specifically linked to articles in the Paris Agreement, but of increasing importance. And one, of course, is the ocean climate nexus, institutionalized of the annual institutionalization of the annual oceans dialogue. Uh, and, and in addition, parties are encouraged to really incorporate oceans-based action in your national goals, in your NDCs, in their implementation, in their strategy. Uh, this, of course, given the importance uh, from a science perspective as well of the oceans in, this global, in the global climate um, uh, agenda. Um, we have initial-based solution also now referenced in the, in the decision text. Um, for the mitigation and adaptation in relation uh, to forest covers and carbon loss. Um, another one which is quite uh, important uh, in practical, this has practical importance, is really in relation to language um, that relates to non-state uh, order action, private parties, uh, private actors in terms of the net zero pledges, and really in terms of the concern over greenwashing. This is a big concern. And the US uh, SG last year established a high level expert group of net zero uh, emission commissions, uh, emissions of non-state entities. And really the idea being here, you know, to examine to hold um, non-state actors to account for their climate pledges, right? Um, and the report was just issued um, uh, during COP, uh, as a side event uh, at COP, during the COP. Um, and the report really, um, was quite damning in terms of the amount of greenwashing that is um, that it detected uh, uh, taking place right now. The report uh, provided a set of five principles and ten recommendations with advice on various aspects of the net zero process, and this really is designed to enhance transparency and again accountability for these climate uh, pledges uh, by non-state actors. Um, so, quite an important report. Um, going forward, what can we expect? expectations really are this net zero for private sector is, is going to be expected to move more and more into the regulatory space. We have countries like Australia are looking at that, so they could be uh, via the stock exchange rules or some other disclosure mechanisms. Uh, but we can see more of the diffusion of that in various jurisdictions, who are in, some of whom are getting very concerned about the level of, level of greenwashing on part of corporate entities. So an important consideration. Um, many parallel activities, I won't go through them all here. It's really just to focus on the fact that don't ignore um, the number of initiatives that are taking place outside of the formal agenda. Um, so you see launches um, of partnerships on hydrogen, partnership, uh, CCS type related to partnerships, um, supply chains as well from the US announced uh, a change in the federal procurement rules to require suppliers to actually have PA in, uh, aligned emission reduction targets. So that's quite important uh, in a practical sense. So what are some uh, reflections? I would say implementation phase is recognized, urgency is recognized, but in terms of actual progress was actually quite mixed. We saw advances in some areas, we saw slow progress in other areas, right? So establishment of loss and damage fund was historic. It reflected a remarkable shift in the positions of developed countries. Um, as I said, it really only changed in the last few days. Um, Thursday night, the EU you know, actually made an announcement that they were prepared to consider this. Of course, provided it's for climate vulnerable states, uh, provided their base of donors, so to speak. So the key now is to how do we maintain to build that momentum given the really challenging discussions ahead on the open questions that I flagged earlier. Um, in terms of driving ambitions, climate action um, generally was regarded as falling short. 
Um, few countries followed through on the pledge at Glasgow to revisit and strengthen the NDCs. Um, language on 1.5 was retained, but some felt that it was really a little bit too weak. We didn't see any heightened climate action. Um, no mention of peaking of emissions, uh, or methane reduction targets, no clear through, uh, clear follow through action on the phase down of coal. Perhaps in reaction to this, a coalition of high ambition countries um, called at the end of 27 called a press conference and they called for emissions to peak by 2025 and for the world to be on a path to phase out all fossil fuel, not just coal, but all fossil fuels. Um, so what will happen next year remains to be seen. In energy transitions, I just wanted to spend a little bit more time. It was a very fraught discussion. Um, yes, you know, they were take, we're talking about energy transition in a climate of um, energy prices, international security crisis, so on and so forth, in an era where fossil fuel has been weaponized, so to speak. Um, so against this background, we, we saw India's call, which was supported by a number of countries, to expand the phase down of unabated coal to all fossil fuels. This was pushed back. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is one of those who pushed back. Um, the Egyptian presidency, um, some have criticized for, for not being proactive in following through on this. Uh, be that as it may, uh, that language didn't make its way in. So it remains as a phase down of coal only. Um, the language in the decision text also refers to increase in low emission uh, energies uh, alongside renewable energy sources. Um, and, uh, you know, stress imposes clean energy mix, including low emission and renewable energy. So it's kind of a nod to the continued use of natural gas uh, as an example. Um, which was really supported and pushed for by some constituency. Um, effectively, what, what we see through this background on discussions on energy transition is really the role of geopolitics, the role of domestic politics, and also industry lobby. Uh, a lot of, uh, a huge presence of ONG, oil and gas industry players at this particular COP, um, and a lot of meetings and discussions dedicated to, um, uh, you know, emissions reduction technologies, CCS, and use of uh, uh, and clean up technology, so to speak. Uh, will we see more of this in COP28? Very possibly, it's going to be a COP that's going to be held in, in UAE next year. Um, so amidst the energy transition, I think what is also quite important um, is really, I think, looking ahead to focus really on the practicalities of energy transition. All well and good to talk about energy transitions, renewable energy, uh, but for many countries, it's a real issue of the finance gap. Uh, and that needs to be addressed uh, because countries need to have that support in order to re reorient um, their energy use and energy mix. Uh, not an easy task. Uh, and so those issues of under disbursements of funds uh, really will need to be uh, addressed well as part and parcel of this discussion. All right. Um, I'll skip this given time. We can, we can look at this um, in the questions uh, and answer session. So again, in terms of finance, um, some progress, but you know, um, huge gaps remain, and this were all flagged in, in the decision text as well. I will leave that for your reading, um, but really that it just shows the the, the depth, the depth of the, the gulf in terms of the financing needs and what is there and what needs to be done. Right? No clear agreement as well on the definition of climate finance. What does it uncover? Grants, loans, so on and so forth. So without a clear definition, it's also very hard to reach agreement on quantum that's actually needed. Um, so let's just, so having dealt with the content of the discussion, I'd like to move to really drawing the link to implications for the research and education agenda for institutions. Um, and what is quite clear is that looking at the range of issues uh, in this climate debate, and climate discussion, very important to really kind of uh, consider mainstreaming environment and climate education um, across all levels um, and across all institutions. And that seems to be quite important as a background because of the linkages between climate and, and issues of, you know, even human rights issues, oceans issues, um, biodiversity issues, huge interlinks. Also calls for a very interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary research and education approach, looking combining science, law, policy, business uh, as well. Right. Um, and this is really an area where we see a lot of value in collaboration within institutions like in NUS, between CIL, APSEL, Center for Nature-Based Solutions, Tropical Marine Science. So a huge uh, value in collaboration in combining 
uh, the expertise and of, of the different uh, departments within the institution, huge value in collaborating uh, across different institutions, across different geographies, and of course, collaboration with multi -stake, multiple stakeholders, be, be it government uh, policy makers, um, industry players, academia, research institutions, civil society. Um, precisely because of the number of issues, the number of actors involved, this kind of approach is very, very critical and, and quite quite critical and essential in the in this area in particular. Um, so it, just a quick snapshot, I won't take up too much in terms of what um, CIL has been doing and kind of resources that are available. Feel free to go on the links. Um, this, this kind of um, really explains and underscores what I mentioned earlier about the need for this really cross-disciplinary approach. Um, network across different uh, expertise, across different institutions, and trying to bring them together. And what we tried to do, what we did uh, in this, in the lead up to COP27 this year, where we ran workshops together with UNFCCC Secretariat for government officials, um, particularly the Asia Pacific region, uh, in preparing for the discussions in, coming up in COP27. Um, and um, also recently in October, we partnered with Durham and again with the UNFCCC in conducting workshops on the global stock take processes, uh, focusing on oceans and GST generally. Um, in terms of participation, yes, also a various you know, opportunities for institutions um, and non-state party, uh, non uh, parties to participate and to contribute and to really move the needle as well in the discussions, in the debate and in the narrative. All right. What can we uh, look at looking forward? Again, to COP28, Melissa mentioned the opportunities to participate in the Singapore Pavilion to put up more events. Um, and in the, in the lead up to them, there's again a whole year where we can do more. And, and we do plan to do more in terms of organizing two other major conferences with uh, Dara next year, specifically looking at the GST process. So again, um, and of course, on top of that, we will continue to run other capacity building programs uh, in the preparations for COP28. So those who are interested, uh, do reach out as well. Opportunities for research collaboration, do reach out as well. All right, so thanks very much. Happy to address any questions later. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, our final speaker today is Dr. Linda Yanti Sulistiawati, a senior research fellow at EPSEL at NUS and also an associate professor of law in Universit Universitas Gadja Mada in Indonesia. Her research focuses on international environmental issues such as climate change, red plus, environmental court and tribunals, marine plastic pollution, land issues and customary issues. Linda was also a member of the delegation leading Indonesia's negotiations of the Paris Agreement um, at COP21. And from 2018 to 2022, Linda is the lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Six Assessment Report. Linda, please. Thank you, uh, Melissa and uh, everybody uh, that are already here. I'm just gonna step away from the podium. It's, see, you can only see my head and it's not cool. Okay. <laughs> so I think Melissa and Daniel already highlighted like most things that we want to, you know, criticize and, and successes in the COP. Uh, so I would just like go, glance away and like highlight uh, my rent for you. So <laughs> it's actually like there were like a lot of expectations uh, towards this COP27, specifically because 26 was delayed one year and then and then we have a lukewarm result from 26 also. And we're hoping that 27 would be A, right? But no. Uh, <laughs> So it re reiterates many of the Glasgow Climate Pact goals that Melissa and Daniel already said until uh, the last minute, they didn't even mention a broader uh, uh, fossil fuel face down. And then there's this guy from this Pan-African Parliament president that iterated that fossil fuel issues cannot be delivered before major commitments are delivered. So it's like, you give me, you give us money or nothing. So it's like, you know, dudes, you know, everybody was here for a compromise, but it, it didn't, you know, until 
until the last minute. So I guess this is one of the highlights, if you may, from COP27 that you need perseverance, right? Even urgency, like, pushing for urgency needs perseverance. So that's, I think, um, our, um, if there's any negotiators here, hats off for you, you didn't give up until the last minute, right? I was a negotiator in COP21, and we thought it was the last minute until the presidency told us that they were going to extend it for another two days. So I was like, huh, more perseverance? Uh, yeah, but anyway, it was like, um, a lot of disappointments, uh, specifically for um, the fact that 1.5 language was very mild uh, and nothing was uh, specifically uh, popped out when you are talking about how this was important for for us uh, as a as a community in the world that want to save the the, the planet. Uh, the Secretary General for the UN also reiterated, he says that we are on the way of climate hell with one foot in the accelerator. So it's like driving and like, yeah, <laughs> we died together, right? Oh, it's so sad. And, and then, and then, um, yeah, so so uh, 25 countries. Uh, I suppose Melissa said 23, but my my source said 25. So probably Melissa is right. Um, uh, submitted their NDCs, like um, they call it, uh, more ambitious NDCs to reach the COP27, but it didn't. It wouldn't be enough for 1.5. So it's a grave concern. And one of the successes uh, that is like very, very uh, highlighted is loss and damage. Uh, we talked about this during um, the visit of Prof. Daniel Bodansky here to NUS, and he was saying that we didn't think loss and damage would get this far. You know, the developing countries shouldn't get anything. That's like, you know, that's very developed country language. Uh, as the developing country person, I got really triggered. And I told him he should have, because he was like grading everything. So he gave loss and damage a C. I was like, C? C is still passing. They should have given F, right? Uh, but now, now they pass. <laughs> now they get a C because they agreed on uh, the funding mechanism for loss and damage. Uh, although no details uh, at all. So just agreement, which I think, you know, it's like letting your kids you know, okay, you can go home late, but never saying like what, how late and, you know, whether the door would still be open or whether they would, you know, there'd be food for you. So, so yeah. So anyway, but the, the, the LND uh, mechanism is agreed. Um, as an Indonesian, um, I think the G20 meeting was even stronger in terms of reiterating the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the G20 leaders uh, made a statement and they agreed to pursue efforts to limit the global temperature increase to 1.5. Um, and then uh, on the sideline of the summit, this is like a joke, I think. Uh, you'd understand my joke later. But on the sideline of the summit, US, Japan, and the partners, you know, Norway's and other countries, said that they would mobilize 20 billion US dollars of public and private finance to help to help Indonesia shut coal power plants and bring forward the sector's peak emission date by seven years to 2030. So is 20 billion US dollars a lot of money? Yes or no? Is 20 billion dollars uh, a lot of money for coal industry? No, why not? How much money does Indonesia get in six months of coal? More than 20 billion or less than 20 billion? More, how much more, sir? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's important. But I'm just, you know, just like simple calculation. Would it be how much more than 20 billion? in six months. 
okay. I didn't have any idea either until I did this research. So Indonesia generated 38 billion US dollars in export earnings in the first semester of 2021. And what? And they want to give us 20 billion to stop coal? Are you kidding me, right? I mean, they wouldn't. It gives us probably some research and development for something else, you know, to build renewables, to help uh, people understand that coal is bad for you, like awareness campaign, and maybe some transition from coal to something better. But in terms of coal, Indonesia is the second world's biggest coal ex exporter in the world. So the fact that my government took the 20 billion, I think they're just milking it. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's easy money. Woohoo, $20, yeah, let's go, 20 billion. But yeah, but, but in reality, it's not, you know, it's not even close. So it's the dilemma that we have as developing countries. I'm sure not just Indonesia, but also other countries in ASEAN, like Vietnam, the Philippines, you know, when they offer you like, ooh, $20 billion, uh, maybe not, you know, maybe not enough. You know, maybe they need to give us more. So Indonesia, this is like the main problem now that we have in the country. Uh, when we're talking about uh, lowering our GHG and also emission. The first one is coal, uh, mainly because we earn so much money from it, and then mainly because we have so many co uh, coal power plants, which uh, provide electricity, and uh, by 2056, they were supposed to stop commissioning under a new greener long-term economic vision. So with the new deal of $20 billion, they, they were going to pu push it forward anyway push it forward for peaking in 2030, and maybe push it forward for six years. So six years and plus a free $20 billion, that makes sense. So uh, it's uh, in Indonesian, we call it, Chinese and Indonesian, we call it Chuan. It's still Chuan, like we still get profit. So, <laughs> so uh, Indonesia will peak in uh, 2030 and then pushes its net zero by 2050. Um, uh, currently uh, still not quite sure how to do it. So when we are talking about Paris Agreement, like what Melissa was saying, uh, NDC was supposed to be bottom up. In reality, in developing countries, I'm pretty sure in developed countries too, but they don't really talk about it. But in developing countries, NDC is very top down, right? Like I'm pretty sure people who has negotiated for their countries would understand because who put up like this percentage of NDCs, you know? They just come up with, like in Indonesia, they came up with, ooh, 29%, that's a good number. <laughs> and then people in the ministries courting around, like, what are we going to do? What are we going to cut, right? So, um, so that's an, another thing that, uh, that comes up when we are talking about international agreement being adopted into national situation. Sometimes it's just, it's just very hard. You can do it, but you need to do it together, right? You need to like really, really um, focus and, 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 and maybe also getting, uh, getting to come out alive, you know, survive from it. And okay, so uh, Indonesia is exploring ways to keep consuming and extracting values from coal. So facing down, right, with CCS. Although um, it's just a, a starting now, starting, uh, not really, we don't really have the technology yet. That's why the technology transfer is very important. And then if we transition to cleaner energy sources, uh, departing from coal, Indonesia will reduce our emission by 38%. So it's a big chunk. Okay, this is our first problem when we're talking about uh, GHG emission reduction in the country. Uh, this is just a graph for you guys to sort of see the yellow bars here. Everything is going up, up, up. And then suddenly here, 20 billion to go down. <laughs> no, yeah. So uh, uh, not, not, you know, not being uh, unhopeful, but I think we need, we, need, we need more efforts. Okay, this is our second problem, which is deforestation. Not just in Indonesia, but also in many countries with a lot of tropical forest. 
What you see here is a picture of um, primary forests that have been cleaned for uh, palm oil plantation. Uh, these ones, right? Uh, we pledge for carbon neutrality in 2030, but no firm commitment to end deforestation because we think the we by we, I'm saying the government still think that um, deforestation is needed at you know at some point. Um, government of Indonesia stated that the forest fires has fell for uh, to 82 percent in 2020, and they rehabilitated rehabilitate uh, 600,000 hectares of mangrove forest and more uh, forest uh, rehabilitated. Uh, <clears throat> there was like a statement by an NGO in Indonesia, 600,000 hectare in terms of land is just the size of Bali. Have you been to Bali? Yeah, it's pretty big. But in Indonesian scale, it's very small. Yeah, so it's it's, Again, language, right? <laughs> the way what you know, you say it, what you want to say it, but uh, and then the government gets really angry when they get criticized. Well, it's a small, it's a small area, but you know, at least they're doing something, which is good. <clears throat> and then we have this moratorium on uh, clearing uh, primary forests, which contributed to 45% drop in deforestation moratorium areas in 2018 compared to 20, uh, 2002 to 2016. Now the moratorium is permanent. So you, uh, when you uh, go to Indonesia and you want to start a new palm oil plantation, you cannot do it on primary forest. You would have to go to forest that's already been uh, cleared before. And then I'm just gonna skip this because I might go to jail. And then, uh, <laughs> I heard there's somebody from the embassy. No, right, okay. So tackling deforestation <laughs> will cut Indonesia's emission by 60%. So if you can imagine 60 plus 38, it's already 98%. That's a whole chunk of Indonesia's emission uh, if we tackle both. And then we still have this too, oil and gas. We're not, uh, Indonesia is not a big, a big uh, exporter. Uh, we're out of OPEC, um, but we're, we still have some oil and gas. We uh, also uh, share it with you guys. Thank you very much uh, <laughs> for uh, the payment. And then, <laughs> and then um, this is like the dilemma that you see when you say, okay, we're going to reduce uh, fossil fuel um, energy uh, source, whatever. But if you see from 2020 to 2050, the demand is still high and it gets bigger. So um, they're still thinking, what are, what are, what are we going to do, right? Uh, re renewable is the yellow one. Uh, coal is the, uh, I don't know, this Korean color. Uh, teal, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, my English is... And then um, uh, gas is the red one, and then oil is the yellow one. So you can see in 2050, we have projected like more uh, demand than, 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 than what we have. So this is what they're going to do in terms of oil and gas uh, versus renewables, right? They want to face uh, facing down on fuels. Uh, we already have carbon tax, and we're going to sort of start organizing carbon trading. We already have the regulations uh, by like last month. So not nothing is uh, established yet, but we have the regulations. And then um, uh, co-firing coal plants with renewable energy. They were thinking like using like plastics, uh, uh, waste, etc. And then retirement of coal plants, of course, from the $20 billion. <laughs> And then CCS and CCUS, <coughs> carbon uh, capture storage. Um, Indonesia also holds more than a fifth of the world's nickel, a crucial component of batteries and uh, used in electric vehicles. Uh, that's why probably Tesla is going to open um, a factory in Indonesia, but the office is probably in Singapore. <laughs> And then the world's uh, third largest so uh, source of cobalt, uh, another final input. Uh, 
the economists suggest uh, their, their, their analysis saying that Indonesia will probably the, be the fourth largest producer of green commodities in the world after Australia, Chile, and Mongolia. So this is the guy, uh, my president, if you don't know him, then not very cute, but nice, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this is, this is what we have. Like <laughs> we have, uh, we are one of the countries that reported to uh, COP28, COP27 with enhanced in NDC from 29% individual effort to 31.89%. And then with international support from 41% to 43.2%. And then we want to move forward our net zero to 2050. And, um, it's important to ascertain, ascertain these new targets are applicable in the lo local levels because um, based on my research in 2019, we still don't have anything intact in terms of regulations in the local level for NDCs. We have some on climate change, but nothing on NDCs in 2019. So I'm gonna do a, another sweep of research in 2023 and see whether we have local level regulations. Because unlike Singapore, there are in Indonesia 548 local governments, which each of them are almost autonomy. They have very high independence to decide whatever they want to do, including to implement the national NDCs. I think I'm gonna close there. I think I woke up everybody now. <laughs> Thank you so much, waiting for the discussion. Thank you so much, Linda, for that very enlightening and entertaining presentation. Um, can I invite you to take a seat on stage? And um, also, Melissa, if you could please join us for our panel discussion. Thank you for thank you to our speakers for the very uh, very good presentations that gave us a good overview of uh, the developments at COP27 and what it could mean for our region. Time is a bit tight, so I'm just going to open up the floor straight for questions um, before I interrogate them with my own. So if I could, and if anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hands and uh, my colleagues will pass you a microphone. Please do state your name and affiliation uh, before you go into your question. Anyone for now? Okay. Akash? Uh, I think I'm not enough. Can I? Okay. So what, for the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Akash. I'm a postdoc at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. Um, so my question is that you've seen and you've been there while these, the countries and the representatives are talking about reducing uh, uh, emissions and everything, right? But then when you look, follow the local news, you see a lot of very contradictory action on the ground. Like, for example, especially when it comes to researchers on the ground reporting whether it's biodiversity issues or climate change issues. So how does one tackle that hypocrisy at the international stage? Or do you even tackle it or you just ignore it? Uh, Linda, I think this question is for you. <laughs> Thank you, Akash. Um, <clears throat> I think... I think it's, it's, hard, it's a hard question to answer diplomatically. Right, um, uh, it's it's easier when you have a smaller country like Singapore, because then uh, the government's the central government's hand can reach everybody, right? While in a country like India, China, Indonesia, the U.S., the, it, everything is huge, and the central government is just in the central government, and and specifically people who are going to uh, who are negotiating in the international level are mostly people from the central government. Uh, are they ignoring uh, what's going on in the lo local level? I don't think so. But up to a certain point, uh, when I'm talking about my country specifically, because we have regional autonomy, and as I, I told you, so local governments uh, have very high independence in doing pretty much everything they want, uh, although the money would come from the central government. But, uh, but the central government can't really directly dictate what the local governments have to do. 
right? And the local governments, uh, for example, in during COVID, right? The local government would send out priorities to the central government, priority sectors, to be um, budgeted or to be, you know, to be budgeted to be uh, paid for by the central government, right? And 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 nobody, no one, <laughs> 548 of them do not include climate as the top three priority. So the 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 most famous top three top three priorities for central governments in Indonesia during COVID. Can you guess what's the first one? Health, health sector for vaccine for everything, right? And then the second one is, you know, if it's like in the rural area, it's agriculture. If it's in the urban area, then it's industry. And then the third famous one is education. Now, do we really have to bargain with our children's education when we want to save the climate? Do we want them smart or do we want them alive? <laughs> we want them both, right? We want them to have both. But it's not, you know, it's not as easy as that. So I think that's where people like you and I, researchers, um, academia, students, um, that's where we, NGOs, we can apply the pressures and say, you know, why is this not being done in the local level? Right? Hey, local level governments, you know, can you do this for us, or what can what can be done? Um, you know, you you write in in the in the media where people read. You know, you write on your Facebook. Nobody is using Facebook, right? It's, it's like old people social media, <laughs> including me. But like you you write on LinkedIn, you write on uh, Instagram, whatever. It's it's. I guess the more exposure that we get on the fact that NDCs or, or you know, uh, obligations to lower GHG in our countries is being met or not met, that's probably good, right? That's one. What's the second one? Can you guess, as lawyers, what would you do? You go to court, man. Yeah, you make a petition, you go to court, challenge them, if, if your country is a democratic country. I have to know, like in ASEAN, there's only a few of us. But like if, right, if you have a democratic country and then you can go to court, please do, right? Because it's the government's obligation to do that, right? And then if they're being reminded like that, and then they probably, the, 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 the possibility of them doing their job better is higher rather than us just criticizing, eh, eh. hey, dude, what if I see you in court, right? And then they get, oh, <laughs> maybe not, you know, maybe we just do our, our job better. Or maybe you go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> that's, also, that's also an option, sadly. But yeah, but I, uh, cl climate litigation is on the rise. And you know, not just not just in developed countries. And you heard about the Netherlands, you heard about Germany, but also in Pakistan, in India, right? In Nepal, uh, 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 in 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 the Philippines, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, for for some respect. So so yeah, so it's a possibility also. So don't worry, we still have outlets to pressure the government. So on that note, I was wondering, Daniel, if you could chime in. I think earlier in your slides, you did talk about how the outcomes at COP27 did highlight the importance of collaboration. How do you think research and education can you know, work to help you know, narrow this disjuncture between the federal and the local levels? Uh, thanks very much for the question. I, I think the... the the this the disjunct between federal and local levels, or maybe I'll just dial it back. Um, I think appreciate the last question. There certainly are examples where there is a disjunct um between the federal and the local level, as what Linda has also elaborated. Uh, but there are also uh, good examples of where cities are actually doing more than the federal level, right? Um, particularly during the uh previous US administration, uh, certain states were far more proactive in the climate action, and they were able to do so because of the internal constitutional uh, demarcation of powers. 
Um, so, you know, where 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 this collaboration, this is really an area where I suppose if you look purely at the lawyers, um, and I think that would be together with the political scientists, looking at how do you, what is the domestic sort of a cost regime within the country? Um, how does that offer avenues for a better collaboration and alignment? Um, of course, litigation is one of the ways, but litigation also tends to be contentious. It can be time-consuming, it can be uh, expensive, and it can be unpredictable. And so the question is really where lawyers can work together with um, domestic civil society, um, networks with industry, um, and of course with government officials and policymakers and scientists to really press home the point um, of the issues and the dangers that need to be posed. And often it's often a, a question of the conversation. I mean, even in our recent uh, uh, workshop that we uh, conducted in on October on the GST issue, it was very clear that, you know, even between lawyers and scientists, there's a lot more uh, that we can do together uh, so that we can speak the language um, in a way and combine the expertise to send a message to the policymakers. Um, and I think that's a very good example of where research, capacity building, putting data together in the same room, having that discussion is going to be extremely important for com level headed conversations. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. I think we have a question from, from the audience. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Uh, my name is Aisha al Sarihi. I am a research fellow at the Middle East Institute. Uh, my question is about the uh, staying within 1.5 degrees Celsius. And given that we are actually in a climate emergency time where we don't have time, really. Um, and so we have seen that the procedures and the nature of the negotiations are somehow slow. Uh, so it's really hard to uh, come up with agreement. And uh, because of the nature also of the NDCs, which are nationally determined and the collective um, you know, uh, action so far has taken us to 1.8 degrees Celsius. Um, and what we have seen from COP27, that there are some distractions from you know, the Russia-Ukraine war and today in the headline, I have seen, for example, France has actually uh, turned on the coal uh, power plants and they call it uh, trans transitional fuel. So each time we will see a new distraction. And next year, COP28 will take place in the UAE, in Dubai, which is a better state. And so my question is like, from your opinion, how do we make sure or what is the best mechanism that COP28 in Dubai is not going to be another distraction from the 1.5 degrees Celsius? Okay. Thanks, Aisha. And just to let you guys know, Aisha was also at COP27 representing the NUS Middle East Institute. Um, Melissa, would you like to take her question? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question, uh, Aisha. Thanks so much for, for that. Um, I mean, the good thing is that it's being held in, in Dubai, right? And the world's eyes will be on Dubai. And just like in Sham, uh, those of us who were there, uh, there were, you know, uh, posters plastered everywhere, you know, about how the COP venue was solar powered and the banks were going green. I imagine that there would be some of that as well, some drive uh, by the UAE to showcase um, how they've made progress. But I think uh, what Linda pointed out so eloquently was the scale, right? So whatever they're going to showcase is probably not comparable even to the, the big scale petrol state that, that you've just pointed out um, that, that the UAE is. Um, there's no real way, like countries are all sovereign, um, so the, the COP process can only take you so far. Countries go, they negotiate multilaterally and come up with some compromise text. Um, and for some, some of you may have heard me say this before, everybody goes home from a COP a little bit unhappy because if we've done, we, if we go home very happy, we've done something terribly bad for the environment, for the planet, because we all met our interests. Uh, many of them are economic interests. So um, ultimately, I think uh, it's it boils down, uh, it goes back to the national level and whether countries on, uh, you know, go back and implement um, what they said they would do uh, at the NDCs, uh, their net zero targets. Um, there is the, so Danielle mentioned the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. 
It's a long name, but basically the name already suggests that there are no penalties, no formal punitive penalties if you don't meet your NDCs. So we're all in this boat together. If we, if if one or more parties decide that um, this is not worth their time, then it's just going to sink the boat. So I think uh, Singapore, in Singapore, we're very realistic. Uh, we have to, we have to do adaptation, <laughs> right? So mitigation 1.5, yeah. Good, we have to achieve, we have to try and achieve it. But the reality is that we have to build climate resilience. We have to, to create adaptive capacity because the, the weather is going to change whether you like it or not. Sea levels are going to rise whether you like it or not. Um, and I think more countries, of course, with adaptation and loss and damage at COP27, it's quite clear that, that more countries are placing importance uh, on, on both those issues. Um, I don't think I've answered your question fully, but I think uh, the, the point really I'm trying to make is that uh, it really depends what you go home to do. Right from the cops, and I, I think cops are are great to raise exposure uh, and give people um, who who get to go to cop a, a chance to see what countries uh, do there and negotiate how they negotiate and try and broker. But also there are also countries who go there and, and throw a spanner in the works, right? So I think calling them out um, for for what they've done. Uh, is important, so transparency is really important. And I think we, we all obviously need to work together and partner. Um, there are many opportunities to do that, to, to try and raise the level of ambition so we can keep 1.5 alive. This reminds me of COP24 in Poland, which is like a coal state. And in the Polish pavilion, they were like promoting green coal. So, I don't know, do you see that? <laughs> they, had, they had a coal display uh, at the Polish pavilion at COP24, which was like, oh my God. <laughs> Okay. Can, can I just jump in on that question, if I may, very quickly? Um, and I do think it, uh, Aisha raised an important point, but you know, the practical reality is that you know, all negotiations on a multilateral level take place in a geopolitical context. You cannot escape from what is happening. Whether you call it distraction or not, it is really one of the conditions that countries will go into these negotiations, and they have to balance a myriad of considerations. Health is important. Global climate is important. Economics are important. And the climate arena is one where everybody has to move or nobody moves, unfortunately. And, and each will do its own. So the question now is, we have seen that, that, that for 1.5, energy transition is key, is critical. But there are practical realities in doing a switch to renewables. Even for developed countries, rich countries, they have problems with that. And you see that very clearly. What more do, what, 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 how much worse is it going to be for others? And so, you know, I think the critical part is we have to accept that that's a reality. Uh, we will have to move to energy transition as much as possible. But we, the reality of fossil use will continue with us for a while. And the question is, are there going to be, uh, can we concentrate efforts on disruptive technologies that will really move the needle in terms of capturing carbon from the air. You know, IPCC report did talk about that, you know, critical to also rely on that kind of technologies to reduce the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. That's what we can do hand in hand. Um, and, and hopefully that can be less, uh, can, be, can proceed uh, more neutrally regardless of the geopolitical considerations. Actually, I have a follow-up question. So, I mean, this year we did see a lot of geopolitical inst instabilities worldwide and of course the war really exacerbated that. But on top of that, we also see a year of climate impacts, right? I mean, firstly, you can actually see the actual like heat waves in Europe, uh, floods in China, in uh, Malaysia. How do you think all these developments, coupled with the fact that the IPCC latest assessment report was also re fully released this year, did, how, how did that weigh in um, on this year's negotiations? Did you think that that had a bearing at all? Um, okay, Linda? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is my plug-in for IPCC because um, I'm an author. And um, uh, Aisha was actually correct. And, and just to add on uh, Daniel's point, when you go to um, AR6 in IPCC report, assession, assessment report six, and you go to uh, my working group, which is mitigation, and then you look at, um, there's a table there that sort of like very easy to read, the alternative energies that are available and also profitable. And, they, and we listed like all these lists and we sort of like shop it around the countries, you know, so that, that for them it will be easier to 
pick whether they want to pick wind or solar or whatever, you know, uh, a green coal. <laughs> There's no green coal. But yeah, but so um, uh, the alternatives are there, right? And, and um, uh, whether or not the countries are going to choose that, we cannot impose, right? We, we can pressure them, but we cannot like force them to do it. It's their own decision to make. Um, uh, I think um, whether it is IPCC or UNFCCC or, or negotiators from other countries, it will be, uh, it will be uh, our challenge to sort of make things easier to understand for them, right? For, for you know, uh, coal producer countries, for oil and gas dependent countries. Um, on the other hand, you also need to understand, like these countries, sort of their survival is depending upon these things. So, um, what what we offer in 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 you know in in research and science is sort of you know you have other things to live on, right? But you also have to couple it with finance. You have to couple it with technology. You have to couple it with you know. Uh, Everything, right? <laughs> unless, unless you know, unless uh, uh, the the offer is uh, too hard to refuse, and then it will be hard for them to depart from fossil fuels, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Lina. Um, Daniel, did you want to chime in? Uh, no, I think I think uh, Linda has has really. But, you know, hit the nail ahead. The, the, the reality is, you can um, spread the message as much as you can. Ultimately, the, the political leaders within their countries are going to be also very much guided by domestic politics. What are the needs of the country? I mean, you know, my other side, I didn't go into details, but you know, you can see the huge gaps that remain. If you want to invest, you know, you need something like US four trillion a year to be invested in renewable energy until 2030 in order to reach net emission by 2050, something like that. It's just an example. Um, so the challenge is, is huge. Um, we should all continue to plug it, but um, those are the realities we work with um, and, and how much, what else can we do uh, collectively uh, to, to move the needle. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder whether Europe suffering like the worst heat waves on record actually affected its willingness to contribute to the loss and damage facility this yeah. year. Okay, so I know I'm that sure, we I'm have... Sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, we have one, one question from the audience. Sorry, I know that we have exceeded our time and if you guys have to leave, please go ahead. There's already food outside. But if not, do stay on for a couple more questions. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Somika from Timasic Life Science Laboratories. My question is uh, regarding like enhanced CDCs and many countries are uh, uh, bringing it forward. And most of the things which are about emission or like change of coal fuel, this falls on the big companies and businesses. And those companies and businesses need to report it and reduce it. My question is, uh, how does the universities and institutes fall in this group? Are we also supposed to be like an, as an institution or university, are we required to report how much or are we calculating it? how much carbon we are emitting and how can we reduce it as a educational institute or research institute. Okay, Mel, I think you can, this is up your alley. Yeah. Um, so NUS has, uh, uh, we have announced targets. Uh, it's all, all up on the NUS Sustainability website. Uh, and NUS also has a University Sustainability and Climate Action Council that uh, looks at our scope one, uh, two, and three, I believe. Uh, whether or not they are going to publish it is, I think, a matter for the council to decide. But I can assure you that uh, the University Council, made up of a number of directors across um, uh, relevant think tanks, uh, departments in NUS looking at sustainability, uh, are in the council. Also, and they're taking it very, very seriously. And I think uh, some of you may have uh, also read earlier this year, there was a group of students that published a report. Um, I think it was uh, as for our students uh, for fossil free future. And they published a report on divestments. Uh, they, they called for divestments of universities in the fossil fuel industry. So um, I think 
right now, um, you know, students are also calling for universities to uh, do away with with uh, fossil fuels, and I think that has has. Uh, shone some light on how universities operate and what they're investing in and who they allow on their campuses as well. Um, and universities were asked to comment uh, when the report was out. I think uh, there's room for improvement, uh, certainly across all of the, the IHLs in, in, in Singapore. Um, but I think this, this issue is not going to go away. And, and good question. Uh, yeah, feel free to go on the UN, uh, NUS website to have a look at the, our carbon targets. I think we have time for one final question. Okay. Hi, hi Melissa. Uh, hi, I'm Ju Julia. I graduated from NUS Law. Um, my question really is just uh, because when it comes to international law, it's so fragmented. Obviously, also like the countries have to go back. I mean, the, the leaders have to go back and like implement this in their own countries. And you know, as we've talked about, it's very problematic and it's hard to implement. So I'm thinking the next thing. Or the next like group of stakeholders uh, with the power would be MNCs, and I'm just wondering how they are represented at COP. How are like their, you know, they they hold most of the power. I think when it comes to like trends, like uh, going past like political boundaries and all that. If restrictions get too uh, stringent in jurisdictions, they will move out. You know, they hold like the power. So. Wow, I'm nervous talking to a whole crowd of people. But yeah, so I'm just wondering how they represented at COP. Uh, yeah. Daniel, earlier in your presentation, you mentioned that COPs were becoming more like a business fair. So I think you'll be well placed to answer this question. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for the question. It's a good question. And I think, you know, just coming back to what your point about international law, um, you know, climate change law is a subset of law of international environmental law, which is a subset of law of international law. And, and you know, I just wanted to come to your point about fragmentation, which I think is quite a critical and important one. Because when 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 I talked earlier about the, the cross-disciplinary nature of climate change, right, at least certainly it's the same for domestic law as it is the same for international law. It transacts different fields, climate, economics, trade and investment, human rights, Ocean's law. We didn't even have time to get into that. But, you know, certainly one of the key areas that one needs to look at is, and countries are very much concerned about, and in fact, this came to the fore in the mitigation discussions, in the, in the push for stronger mitigation and stronger language. There was pushback from other countries, not necessarily because they were against climate action, but because there was concern that if you have stronger language in that, it sets a stage for domestic litigation, right? And it could set a stage in international law if you have to take certain actions. And right now, countries are facing it. They get sued under investment state laws, investor state laws for taking action to push the climate agenda, shutting down coal plants. Italy was dinged for that, right? Shutting down coal plants, Germany, and they are actually being sued on an international arena by companies. So that good actors and there are there are force for good, and there can be corporate actors that are perhaps working against the, the climate agenda for profit reason. I mean, they are profit-driven companies. So, you know, when we talk about MNCs giving climate pledges, many are doing it altruistically. Some are doing it because they see value for the business, right? Sustainability brings value to the business and they're doing it also driven in part by that. So they can be a force for good as well. So certainly, in, as you say, in the business fairs now, there, there's a huge presence of MNCs. Uh, we saw oil and gas industry. We saw finance industries. We saw uh, carbon capture storage, engineering industries. They're all there. Uh, drum up business, to drum up context, to lobby governments to move the agenda. So they can be a force for good and they can be forced. And they can work behind the scenes or they can be work directly with the uh, UN UN's uh, secretariat or the presidency. So you can see these public-private partnerships. The US, for example, announced, I think, um, their version of financing uh, in, in the earlier stage, in the earlier first week of, of COP, um, where they talked about bringing industry uh, uh, you know, as part of the carbon, using the trading mechanism to deliver finance for to deliver mitigation action. So that's an example of where you know, gov uh, MMSCs are working directly with governments. Um, in the finance sector, actually central banks, a lot of them are actually already pushing ahead 
uh, in the green bonds industry, we see entities like the, um, the I think the uh, Sean Kidney's helped fit the CBI green bonds uh, initiative, where they were already doing this much earlier in pivoting their financing uh, bonds uh, uh, instruments in the way that supports climate action. So those are good examples where MNCs can lead the way. But of course, as I said, we are always very realistic. Um, there are companies which are fundamentally still profit-driven and if their rights, and, and you know they have rights under domestic law, they have rights under international law, investment law. So we need to also make sure that those rights are protected or pivoted in a way that balances those considerations. Um, uh, it's not a one-track issue. Um, it is a complex issue and, and governments have to balance that of all those considerations and all those different sets of laws uh, together. Uh, and that's where, you know, rubber hits the road for the MNCs. Okay, thank you, Daniel. And thank you all for your attention and for staying 15 minutes past our official end time. Uh, we would like to invite you for refreshments outside. And thank you for coming to our third and final lecture on COP27. Thank you very much.